Hi guys, let's continue with our look at enol and enolate chemistry. And we left off with alpha halogenation of aldehydes and ketones. And by the way, it's largely uh, ketones that are alpha halogenated because aldehydes actually tend to undergo a aldol reaction. It's actually hard to do an alpha halogenation of them. Um, wanted to circle back a little bit. Uh, we noted that under basic conditions we always do exhaustive halogenation. Okay, if we have two alpha CHs we replace or both of them uh, with the halogen. If we have three in the case of a methyl ketone, that's the only time you would have three. When we do an exhaustive halogenation, we get three halogens. But in the presence of hydroxide, we can actually do an additional elimination and we end up with a carboxylic acid after workup. So exhaustive halogenation under basic conditions. But let me point out that under acidic conditions, you can just put on one halogen. And if you want to put on just one halogen, it's typically best to do it under acidic conditions. Or that's the, really the only way you can do it. Um, I want to kind of try to explain why it works, uh, but I just wanted to make that statement though. Um, we will see an example. Let's see, in the miscellaneous handout packet, um, to look at the industrial synthesis of Vioxx, a drug that is no longer used because it was determined to have some side effects, um, it was used to treat arthritis, but we see the synthesis here, and right here we have an alpha bromination under acidic conditions, and they are just putting on one bromine, a monobromination. By the way, if you look at this synthesis, all of these reactions, except maybe one, we have covered or will cover, begins with this thioether, friedel crafts acylation. Sulfur has a long pair, expected to be ortho para director, para. Here the sulfur is oxidized. That can be done since sulfur has d orbitals. That's called a sulfone. Then we do the alpha bromination. Then we substitute that good leaving group, bromine, with this carboxylate anion by an SN2, and we make this bond here. Then this molecule undergoes an aldol condensation. All right, it's actually an intramolecular aldol condensation. Uh, when we make a chalcone, we do an aldol condensation reaction, but that is intermolecular. All right, uh, you should look and see what's going on here. What? Uh, triethylamine is the base. It is strong enough to do enolate chemistry. Uh, what enolate carbonion is attacking what carbonyl? Okay. Important to understand this, what's going on here. So, uh, some common reactions there used to make what was a very uh, big money maker for drug industry. Um, Okay, monohalogenation. Let's pick up here. Why would you want to put on a halogen alpha to the carbonyl? Well, we just showed one reason. Because then we can come in and do an SN2, and now we have a leaving group there. And H is not a leaving group. All right, not for an SN2, certainly. And it's certainly not in a traditional sense, but the bromine now can be a leaving group for SN2, and we can make this uh, product here. Um, we could also do, in this example, this looks like a classical E2 with a sterically hindered strong base. We could eliminate 
And what product do we expect here? We expect double bond here. Yeah. H here, tert butoxide, and we do a good old E2. All right. Now this is an important type of compound. It is an alpha beta unsaturated carbonyl. The alpha and beta, there is unsaturation between those two carbons with the double bond. And that double bond is conjugated with the carbonyl. All right. An aldol condensation gives the same type of product. If we look back over here, do you see the carbonyl and the alpha beta unsaturated? All right. Now, let's look at exhaustive deuteration. What's it good for? Yeah, that's right. Well, very similar idea, but if we use D2O, the presence of base, we can actually replace every alpha CH with a deuterium. All right, I'll do one. All right, there's three alpha CHs, but the, this is just hydroxide, but the H is replaced with deuterium. That is possible, you can buy that. Take the H, yeah, and we make Enolate anion. I'm not going to show resonance. Then we can come back and the D2O, we can just reprotonate it. It's not really called a proton anymore, but it's sort of like protonating with water. And that will give. one D, then you just repeat that two more times with the other H here and then remove the other H here. That's how you can get to this structure here. Now, we did create HOD and it is possible for this to take the H, but if it did, it would just go back. If you use excess D2O, it's more likely for it to take the D of a D2O. And the HOD that is formed along the way each time remains very negligible. All right. Now, why would you want to do this? Well, maybe you want to isotopically label it. Perhaps. But one of the a common reasons for doing this is for mass spec studies. Because each time you replace an H with a deuterium, the mass increases by one. Deuterium has a mass of two, H has a mass of just one, so there's a one difference. So this molecule, the mass is going to increase by three. All right. So, how could we use that in mass spec? What if you were, had an unknown, and perhaps it was ultimately this molecule here, but you didn't know it yet. You could treat it with D2O and KOD, each in excess, or sodium OD, or lithium, etc. Okay. Then rerun the mass spec and see how much the mass increases. And that would tell you what? Okay. How many acidic H's are present? Because each one would be replaced with a D. 
as you do this exhaustively. Now, note that I said acidic. I didn't say how many alpha CHs. Those are acidic enough to be replaced. There may be other acidic H's that can be replaced. For example, the H of an alcohol can be replaced. And if you remember with NMR, we did a D2O shake. And there you replace the OH, you don't even need the OD minus, the hydroxide. All right? So you've got to be careful about saying it's just for telling you how many alpha CH's. All right? But say you had an unknown and you did this and the mass increased by two. Certainly that would mean that you do not have three alpha CHs because if you had three, you would have expected the mass to have increased, have increased by three. So two alpha CHs, but it could be less if one of those is maybe an OH or an NH. Okay, you can answer the question here for homework. All right. So that's one reason you might want to do an exhaustive deuteration. Now, you could do this on a small sample and then the sample you put into the waste container if you didn't really need it. If you wanted to get it back, you could come and treat the molecule with proton, just regular water and regular KOH and replace each D back with H's. Hydroxide takes D, make the enolate and then the enolate with there being excess water, takes an H and much less likely to take a D from the HOD that was formed initially. So you flood it with H2O to get back the H's on. Okay. This brings us to B. I reckon A was alpha halogenation. That was sort of an analogous reaction with the deuteration. B is alpha alkylation. And we will begin with direct alkylation. And direct will make more sense when we move to indirect. Okay, the first thing is to remember uh, we're making enolates here. Okay, the enolate is going to be your nucleophile. But if you try to make an enolate with sodium hydroxide, we know that the enolate is not favored because this has a pKa of about 20. That plus water, water would be 16, and the weaker acid is favored. And so with hydroxide, you do not completely make the enolate. And when you do alkylation, you need to completely make the enolate. When we do bromination or, ha or halogenation, you do not need to, okay? This equilibrium here actually favors there. Okay, because this is 20. We make that plus H2O, it's the same story, that's 16. Okay, but the halogenation will work even though this is a poor equilibrium. All right. And to fully explain why, it would take us about 15, 20 minutes, and that, then we'd need a cup of coffee, or, uh, et cetera. But when you do alkylation, it doesn't work. We need a stronger base to completely make the enolate. And one of the most common bases to use for this purpose is LDA. All right, we need to know LDA. That stands for, uh, the DA is diisopropyl amide. That's actually a misnomer. The anion of a nitrogen is called an amide. That's unfortunate because we also have the functional group, the carbonyl containing functional group that is called an amide. All right. Chlorine, the anion is called chloride, I-D-E ending. Hydrogen anion, we call it hydride. Nitrogen uh, or an amine anion, we call it 
amide or an amide. Diisopropyl amide, and lithium is the most common cation. Lithium diisopropyl amide. Instead of an oxygen anion, it is a nitrogen anion, a stronger base. All right. And so it will take an alpha CH. Leave the electrons behind. Give that plus what? Plus diisopropyl amine. The lithium sits with the enolate. This is about 20. Amine as an acid is about 30. We can check the pKa table in the lab manual. Amines as acids, about 30. That's what I thought. Which is favored, 20 or 30? The amine is the weaker acid. Favored by 10 to the 10. Okay. That is 10 billion. So at equilibrium, you had 10 billion of these and only one of these. That's about 99.999 or something, okay, percent. That is essentially considered complete formation of your enolate anion by LDA. All right, I already had that written. And once we get the anion, then it can be a good nucleophile for a good old-fashioned SN2. All right, and we can do that here. What is LDA going to do to acetone? It, we will form the enolate. All right. Now we throw in benzyl chloride, and these electrons will do an SN2, and we will get compound A. And we just made that carbon carbon bond by one carbon carbon ion attacking and displacing the leaving group in an SN2. And we alkylated, we did an alpha alkylation. The alpha carbon now has an alkyl group added to it. And by the way, we will refer back to this compound later. That's why I named it as compound A. All right, I'll let you do these for homework. Pretty straightforward. But here we're bringing in esters and nitriles. And LDA will also make the alpha anion or the enolate of those, okay? Now, we can call it an enolate with the carbonyl. It's not going to be called an enolate when it's next to the cyano group, but it's a similar idea. And we talked about the basicity of those, remember, back at the beginning. Both of those have pKa's of about 25. They're still acidic enough, okay? If they're 25, you're going to 30, okay? It's favored by 100,000. That's still 99.99% and it's still considered complete. All right. So these are just simple direct alkylations using LDA to make the carbanion, aka the enolate, when there's a carbonyl there. We could have shown this reaction in organic one when we were doing SN2, all right? Why not use something like N-butyl lithium to generate the enolate, okay? I mean, it's a strong base. Could it take the H? Well, it could. 
but it's more likely to add to carbonyl. Electrons up. All right. You got to be careful with what base you use. It could act as a nucleophile and add to carbonyl. And once it adds, game over. You just protonate this and you get a reaction of the carbonyl and you're going to get an alcohol product. Just like a Grignard would add, right? All right. Because once the butyl group adds to carbonyl, it is not going to be kicked back off. Do we have to worry about that with LDA? No. Because if the nitrogen added to the carbonyl, it could then get kicked back off. But, what do you think the purpose is of the two sterically hindered isopropyl groups is? All right. Sterically hindered. Not, well, that's not the base. The base is up there. The bulky isopropyl groups help to keep the nitrogen from adding to your carbonyl. All right, that's especially important when you're like maybe using esters, where if it did and carbonyl reformed, you would probably kick off the oxygen. All right, steric hindrance. Um, all right. Let me kind of add this. Two isopropyls. What does that do? Makes it sterically hindered. It also makes it organic. and soluble in organic solvents, even though it is an anion, all right? Sometimes people will show, and we have used this base before. Remember soda mid? It's called just simply sodium amide. It's not diisopropyl amide because there's not, okay? And this is shortened to soda mid. It is traditionally used as base in most every textbook. I don't know why, because it is a horrible base in practice to deprotonate a terminal alkyne. All right? These electrons take the H, these electrons make that plus ammonia. So we've seen that before. The problem is, this compound is not soluble in organic solvents. Hardly any, okay? And you try to do this, it's like adding rocks to your reaction. It just doesn't dissolve. Works great on paper and in textbooks. Um, you know, you could maybe argue you could use it here. The isopropyl groups add the organic nature and help solubilize it, not in every organic solvent, but some, some polar non-products, maybe like THF, um, probably a very common solvent uh, for LDA reactions. Um, the lithium also kind of helps it to be a little bit less ionic. Um, <clears throat> all right, LDA is an important base to know. Um, 
The other sterically hindered base that's very commonly used is terbutoxide, such as potassium terbutoxide or sodium, but the oxygen anion is not quite as basic. All right. Commonly used for E2. It's strong enough to do E2, but it's not strong enough to do enolate chemistry. Um, all right. So, in lithium, not a good choice of base. It's going to add to your carbonyl. Game over. All right. This takes us to indirect alkylation. Very important. We're going to see another way to make compound A. Now, while LDA is very nice on paper, and it's actually, it works very well in the lab, it is a little bit expensive, not as common. Uh, your solvents need to be very dry because if there's any water around, it'll take an H from water. And so there are still some practical considerations um, that make it slightly inconvenient compared to what you might want it to be. And an alternative is to do this chemistry sort of indirectly. And here we're going to use a what I call a dummy or activating group. All right. And what that is going to do is it's going to make the alpha CH more acidic and thus then we can use an oxygen anion base. Um, very important chemistry and we will move into this all right in our next video. Highly recommend you get into your textbook with this chemistry. Very important chemistry. Obviously, everything we teach in organic chemistry is very important. But lots of applications as you move into biochemistry, okay, with this carbonyl type chemistry. All right. We're also sort of building a story here about how these how these alpha CH type compounds can react. All right. Um, can't just kind of learn this in isolation, maybe back in organic one with alkene reactions, how you kind of just learned each one. It's kind of a complete story here you need to be looking to learn. And also taking the opportunity to do that because as your knowledge of organic chemistry has developed, you're more able to learn the sort of the nuances of the chemistry and understand it better. Okay, guys, we'll pick up with indirect alkylation in the next video.